Mexico, Idaho, a small college town that will never be the same. It had been over seven years since the community had seen a homicide. With a population of around 25,000, the economy was bolstered by the 11,000 students at Idaho University. In the early morning hours of November 13th, the unthinkable happened. Four college students, laying peacefully in their beds, were ruthlessly murdered. The suspect, Brian Coburn, a 28-year-old PhD student studying criminology. Four murders in the span of about 16 minutes. How could this happen? And the victims? each full of life and promise. Zanna Kernodal and Ethan Chafin were lovebirds, something that was new for Zanna. She'd never had a boyfriend before. Ethan was an athlete studying recreation management. Together, they were the picture-esque couple that many in their sorority and fraternity aspired to be like. Ethan was a triplet. Both of his siblings attended Idaho University as well. Kaylee Gonsalves and Madison Mogan, best friends for as long as anyone can remember. The two were more like sisters than friends. They were almost inseparable since the sixth grade. The night before that duo had been out at the Corner Club, a bar that a lot of college students hung out at. Afterwards, they went to the grub truck and got some food. Ethan and Zana went to a frat party. There were two other roommates in the house as well. Everyone was home by 2 a.m. And then, in the heavy quiet of the new Sunday morning, four young corpses, all students, all friends, were found hacked to death in their beds in a pale clapboard house a little more than a stone's throw away from the heart of the university's campus. There was so much blood. It had seeped through the wooden floors and run down the building's gray concrete foundation. They just did a great job. I think the FBI was crucial, crucial, yeah. crucial in this investigation because, of course, they have the resources to span the nation and to conduct the analysis. Um, I haven't heard what SWAT team did the arrest. I would believe it would be the FBI SWAT team. They just said SWAT team. Um, but uh, I can tell you as a former 15-year uh, SWAT operator vet, there is no sweeter rest than when we get to arrest somebody who has committed crimes such as these. It's 4.04 a.m. The suspect's vehicle, a white Hyundai Elantra, enters the area for his fourth time. This time, driving eastbound on King Road, turning around in front of 500 Queen Road number 52, and then driving back westbound. Somewhere, he finds a parking spot. Based on roommate DM's statements, records from the phones of her and the other roommate, and surveillance video that was found in the neighborhood, investigators believe that the students were killed between 4.04 a.m. and 4.20. What we'd be looking at here is the psychopathology would be antisocial personality disorder traits, which come from what we call cluster B, which is the erratic, energizing personalities. Narcissism is also part of that. Just to clarify earlier, I don't think that's his prominent presentation. I think that he definitely has traits, at least at what we would call a style level. But I really think that the Machiavellian, that paranoid part, that cynical part, people are against me, nobody cares for me, that that really with the obsessive compulsive traits is driving this forward and gave it a lot of energy. And I appreciate that you found that triad yeah. because it's not commonly seen, but when it does exist, uh, it can lead to a great degree of acting out with really no concern over being caught. That's the other component. I don't believe that he had great concern over getting caught or he simply would have ditched the car earlier. Diem wakes up hearing what sounded like Gonsalves playing with her dog on the third floor. A short time later, she hears someone in the house saying something to the effect of, there's someone here. A forensic download of Kernodal's phone shows that she was probably awake and using TikTok at 4.12 a.m. Diem looks out of her bedroom but doesn't see anything. Diem opens her door a second time, and when she hears what she thinks is crying coming from Kernodal's room, she then hears a male voice say something to the effect of, it's okay going to help you. At 4.17 a.m., a security camera at 1122 King Road, about 50 feet from the west wall of Kernodal's bedroom, picks up distorted audio of what sounds like voices or a whimper, followed by a loud thud. A dog can be heard on the audio barking numerous times. DM opens her door for a third time after she hears crying and sees a figure 
clad in black clothing and a mask that covers the person's mouth and nose walking toward her. She describes the person as male, five foot 10 or taller, but not very muscular, athletically built and with bushy eyebrows. The masked visitor walks past her and she stands in a frozen shock face and then he walks towards the back sliding glass door. She locks herself in her bedroom after seeing the figure whom she doesn't recognize. It would be seven more hours before 911 is called. At 9.12 a.m., the suspect is back in the neighborhood, this time checking to see the status of his early morning slaughter. About seven weeks later, by the time Christmas rolls around, the public is getting anxious. There appears to be no leads, no murder weapon, and no sight of the Elantra. As the hunt for the Elantra proceeded with tedious concentration, the no less discouraging challenge of finding the clue in the forensic evidence, a vast muddle of prints and blood and DNA that had been collected in the house was brought vividly home. Look at where he was, you know, between, you know, 5.25 a.m. and that 9 a.m. if they could get any, uh, and then, you know, after, but he just said he turned his phone off uh, all the way until December 15th or something like that. Um, so it's probably during that period of time that he's um, trying to get rid of that knife. And also, you know, an interesting thing, we pulled the Car Carfax report on, on his white Elantra. And between, I believe, May and August of 2020, he had an excess of 11,000 miles in those three months on his car. I'd like to find out where he was and what he was doing. To as much as he may know about criminal justice or about criminology or about serial killers and that kind of thing. And he, he may have studied them for the purpose of seeing if he could get away mm -hmm. with a, this is not really what we call a serial killer, but this is a mass killing um, and see if he could quote, commit the perfect crime. Well, obviously he did not succeed in creating perfect crime because there are Maybe some man. that he, yeah that he didn't do. If he wore gloves, you know, thinking that he was covering that, but then he turned around and he he yeah. sliced himself. And you've got to remember too. I think there were early on there was a discussion that one of the uh, one of these young people may have uh, have some defensive wounds. Yeah. And if that's the case, then the first thing that's going to happen with that autopsy is they're going to scrape those fingernails. Yeah and see if they've got some sort of DNA evidence underneath the fingernails. So there's a, there are so many aspects of an investigation, especially one that, that, that is this massive, yeah. that uh, are looked into and they are uh, processed, they are, they are recovered, they're processed, and, and then they came to the conclusions that all roads, at least at this point, with and this is by the way i've heard some people talk about circumstantial stuff here the dna evidence is direct evidence it's mm -hmm. not circumstantial right that is direct evidence yeah that, that he was in that room when this thing happened body cam footage showed a string of calls in the months prior to the killings for noise disturbances to 1122 key road it was clear this was a party house so everyone here's trespassing well no one's here that's trespassing but no one they're just not here i have no clue where they went no clue so you guys just don't it wouldn't be until nearly seven tense weeks later when an early morning raid by a police swat team thousands of miles away from the scene of the crime finally arrested a suspect brian Coburn. A 28-year-old doctoral candidate in the criminal justice and criminology department at Washington University. He was pulled from his home in the rural Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania and charged with four counts of first-degree murder and one count of felony burglary. Yet even with his arrest, mysteries remain. Neither reasons nor motives have been revealed that would explain the horror that ended four lives. And in the unhealed aftermath, there remains an armory of fears. 25,000 people in a once seemingly bucolic town nestled in the rolling snow-swept Idaho hills still alert with suspicions. Neighbors seared by the mystery of four perplexing deaths. Victims who have left them victimized too. And in the days following, new revelations about the suspect Brian Koberger came out from posts that he made on an online forum in which he discussed his mental health struggles. There are also interviews available with those who knew him, messages that he sent back and forth with friends. 
He wrote in 2011 whenever he was 16, I feel like an organic sack of meat with no self-worth. Adding later in the same post, as I hug my family, I look into their faces, I see nothing. It's like I'm looking at a video game, but less. Now Mr. Koberger, 28, is facing murder charges, accused of sneaking into a home shared by students just off the university campus in Moscow, Idaho, stabbing four of them to death in the middle of the night. At the time of the killings, Mr. Koberger was in his first semester of the PhD program at Washington State University, which is less than a 15 minute drive from the crime scene. Friends have previously described Mr. Koberger as having an intellectual bent, but said that he occasionally turned cruel and angry. And you almost have to wonder if it's because of his thirst for murder that led him down the path to criminal justice because he wanted to study it, he wanted to learn it more, and maybe he thought he'd learn how to get away with such a crime. So yeah. it's really going to be interesting to see how this all unfolds. but. Uh, you know, I, I can't say that him being a criminal justice major uh, makes him a criminal because I am and I didn't become a criminal. At Washington State, his peers said he wrinkled some people with a habit of over explaining and sounded particularly condescending when he spoke to his female classmates. No surprise, as many experts have said that he was an incel or an involuntary celibate that might despise women and it could be a part of his motive. You know, this guy, you know, obviously he's been educated he's gone to school his professor yeah. was the btk wrote a book i think he's infatuated yeah. with serial killing and to the point mentally that he just wanted to be part of that clan uh, i don't know i mean they're going to start digging deep into social and if he's following somebody and, and tailing them and you know all the pings from all the girls and was he in the same area that all the girls were so they're going to they're going to you know really dra uh, dive down into that but I don't know, man. You know, it's it's hard to say. There's you know, there's 20 different conspiracy theories out there, but I want to sit across from him and ask him point blank, look him in the eye. That's that's how I do things. Investigators worked through the holidays to process thousands of tips and extensive evidence collected in and around the scene. From the outside, it looks as if the case is solved, or so the authorities believed. The white speeding car and the Troy Road gas station video was one clue that led them to Koberger. Uh, the citizens of, of Moscow. A little town there and that surrounding area can can sleep a little easier tonight knowing that this person's under arrest but at the same time uh, i think this is a very good lesson to be learned for everybody there on being vigilant um, you know knowing who you're who you're hanging out with or associating with who's following you you know constantly looking over your shoulder i know it sucks that's the times we live in you know adding security cameras to your residence uh, i understand that this was a rental but there are things that you can do in order to kind of secure your surroundings a little bit more and I think everybody needs to be a little bit vigilant because uh, you can't predict crazy and unfortunately crazy exists. And despite the odds from the chaos at the murder scene, technicians succeeded in extracting a telltale sample of DNA from the knife sheath. On December 27th, Pennsylvania law enforcement agents covertly rummaged through the neighbor's trash that Brian had taken his trash to just outside of their home in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania. When items in the trash were analyzed in the lab, alarm bells started ringing. The matches to the DNA on the sheath were nearly identical to Michael Koberger, the suspect's father. This final piece compelled the puzzle. An arrest warrant was issued for Brian Koberger. In announcing Mr. Koberger's arrest, Moscow's police chief James Fry said investigators had located a white Hyundai Elantra but had not yet found a murder weapon. Chief Fry looked exhausted and almost tearful as he explained the arrest at a news conference, making it clear that investigators were still looking for tips to help resolve the questions they could not get answered. Did the suspect act alone? What was the motive? Chief Fry said, be assured the work's not done, we're just getting started. In Pennsylvania courts, Brian Koberger agreed to waive his extradition hearing and within 48 hours was on a plane headed back to Idaho. He will stand trial in Moscow on four counts of first-degree murder as well as burglary. But even before his journey west, 
Jason Labar, his court-appointed attorney in Pennsylvania, is fighting back. They released a statement saying, Mr. Koberger is eager to be exonerated of these charges and looks forward to resolving these matters as promptly as possible. Mr. Koberger has been accused of a very serious crime, but the American justice system cloaks him in a veil of innocence. He should be presumed innocent until proven otherwise and not tried in the court of public opinion. And while much remains to be sorted, it is clear that one corner of Koberger's life has been lived as a graduate PhD student in criminology, someone who has conscientiously studied the vagaries of evil. In fact, in his purposeful search for knowledge, he had sent out a research questionnaire to convicts asking for their help. He said, I'm inviting you to participate in a research project that seeks to understand how emotions and psychological traits influence decision making when committing a crime. In particular, this study seeks to understand the story behind your most recent arrest with an emphasis on your thoughts and feelings towards your experience. Was this simply a grad student's academic inquiry? Or was a would-be killer asking the professionals, suppose you wanted to commit the perfect crime, how would you do it? And now, under arrest and awaiting trial, has he quite possibly discovered that there is no such thing as a perfect crime?